Hi, my name is Andrew Williams, and it's a great pleasure to be able to join you today at FOSDEM to talk on the subject of FINE, the graphical toolkit for Go. For anybody who was able to make the dev room last year, you might remember that I spoke briefly about this in one of the lightning talks. And today I'm going to talk probably more about what's changed since then. But for anybody who's not familiar with the toolkit, I thought a quick reintroduction might be in order. So what is it that FINE aims to be? Well, we're looking to develop the best toolkit for easily developing beautiful and native graphical applications across all platforms. A big goal for sure, but there's plenty of opportunity in this space, given that so many projects, uh, toolkits and, and other libraries in this area are perhaps a little bit dated in their background. And being part of the Go community offers a great opportunity to build on the tool available and to deliver a brand new API that really rethinks how some of these things work. Of course, it couldn't be done just one person. We have a fantastic team and a whole community built around this communal goal. Uh, we're very lucky to have so much enthusiasm and people dedicating a lot of their time to build this project. And as well, everything that we do is open, freely available. We're using the BSD3 clause license and so everything is uh, possible to be used in your own open source and commercial ventures alike. Now, where has this project, I suppose, come from? Well, a little bit of history then. It started almost three years ago with uh, an idea and uh, some concepts of what it could be. I found that Go was a really great fit and started to learn Go to see what was possible. We then were able to release 1.0, a little bit over a year after that. A lot of hard work, and it really came to be a fantastic first release for developing applications across all desktop environments as it was at the time. Since 1.0, we've had four major upgrades that were all completely compatible with that initial release, added lots of functionality along the way. And just last week, we released the first breaking change of the entire history of the project and a whole lot of new features in a 2.0.0 release. It was an opportunity to set a better direction for some design changes that were needed, clarify the API, and the project's now in a really great shape for a few years to come, which is a fantastic base to build the next few releases on as well. Uh, so how about some statistics about the project? Well, we're very fortunate to have over 12,000 people who've started the project on GitHub and who are seeing what happens along the way. We've got around 80 contributors who have helped build the code as it uh, exists today, whether it's through bug fixes, new feature additions, or helping us with the documentation. We're thankful to every single person who adds something. Nearly 5,000 commits since the project first uploaded to GitHub, and that has been a tremendous effort from everybody involved. The functionality, hopefully, that you'll see later in this talk shows just quite how much is involved uh, as a result. And we have had 19 releases all, all the way through, many of them point releases, keeping bug fixes going, uh, but some of them, as I mentioned above, significant functionality improvements. So then on to the design of the toolkit. We have split design into two areas. There is the API design, which is a core part of the FINE project. We want to make sure that this is really easy to learn and that anybody can get started quickly. So API is very important. We have managed to solve a lot of the challenges faced by traditional toolkits regarding threading, concurrency, other data handling challenges that you might be familiar with if you're a graphical app developer. We have multiple themes um, coded into the way that the widgets are built and so forth. And all of the public API is based on intent and behavior as opposed to the rendering details, which makes it easier to understand the logic of an application and requires less coding. Of course, the user interface itself requires careful design considerations 
We've used material design to provide most of the inspiration for the UI. We're using vector graphics throughout so that you have a really great scalable user interface that's going to look crisp on just about any display. And we are going to adapt the user interface according to the light or dark mode of the computer at the time the application is running. And these considerations are pulling together to make a great consistent user experience. So there's not really any surprises when people are picking up a fine-based application for the first time. As well as all of these thoughts, we have tooling that is going to help you to manage and deploy your applications. I'm touching on it very briefly here, just so you can see what could be done. If you execute the command there, the go get find.io slash find slash v2 slash cmd slash find, it will install our command line helper tool, which can manage things such as installing your application locally. A find install is very much like go install, but it's going to prepare the application like it was a natively installed app. Like you see here, I have find settings installed on my Mac. We're then going to be able to package an application for diff distribution across multiple different platforms. We can specify the OS so that it does the appropriate packaging. So on your Mac, you would be able to build your Windows executables with the appropriate metadata and also mobile applications as well. And just recently, we were able to add the functionality that handles store distribution as well. So it's pretty much a drag and drop experience from build asset to having it available on the App Store now. I illustrated here some additional parameters that might be required to be able to get your application up onto the store in one quick step. But that's enough about uh, the toolkit and what it's been designed to do. Why don't we have a little bit of a look at some code? So hello world, absolutely definitive, of course. Uh, I wanted to show here what a complete desktop application looks like in Fine. Here we're illustrating every single line of code required. We start with the package main. The imports show that we are taking the app package and the widget package. The app package is doing all of the auto detection of platform system configuration and wiring everything together for you. And the widget package, as you would expect, is providing widgets that are built uh, that to be dropped into your application. In our main function, we create a new fine application. We launch a new window titled hello, which might be visible or not, depending on which system you're running on. And then we set the content of this window to a new label widget that simply says hello fine. And then we call show and run, which is going to show the window and run the application. This is two different steps, but we have a helper method there because most applications are going to start by showing one window as it launches. That's all there is to it. Uh, once we've written that code, we can run this just about anywhere. Shown here is what that window is going to look like if you run it on a Mac in light mode, pretty much what you would expect. Being a vector-based toolkit though, we can show that larger and here it is scaled up to 2.5 times the original size and also showing in the dark mode also on a Mac. But of course, this is going to work just as well on mobile as well. So here it is loaded into an iOS phone. You'll see the font look smaller when you're comparing them side by side, but this is by design because the text on your phone is going to be much closer to the eye. So it's providing a consistent experience across different display types. And so that's the application in its raw form where it's going to run. Let's have a look at some of the widgets that the toolkit comprises so that you can build your application from. There's a large variety, in fact. We have text display components like a label, hyperlink, a text grid for more complex formatting, and there's other display elements like a separator, a progress bar. And then we have action elements like the toolbar, a collection of small buttons. We have the button that is there shown with an icon and a piece of text, and pop-up menus that have appeared that could be useful in your application. Then entry widgets and other input elements is a large amount of what any application is going to comprise of. So we have regular entries that have validation built in, got select options, password entries, checkbox, radio button, 
and an illustration of a form there as well that comprises many of these elements. And then there are additional components that have some element of structure uh, as well, such as the card, which material design enthusiasts might be familiar with, and accordion. And there are a few other elements dotted around that haven't been included or that show variations of this. You can, in fact, see them all in action if you load the fine demo application, which is part of the main repository. Here you can see many input elements displayed inside a, a container. We'll see a little bit more about what that means down the road. And naturally, you could display that in a, a dark mode as well. Here it's a different panel showing the form input and how validation feedback can be presented to users as part of their data entry. Now you see that much of this is uh, responding to the current settings of the operating system, but the user also can override these with their own personal preferences. And here we see the settings window that ships with the fine toolkit. User can choose their font size, which actually scales the entire display um, accordingly so that everything is, is large or smaller according to how the user would like. They can pick their main colour and also change the theme to match the system or to specify a preference for light and dark. That's a bit of a whistle-stop tour, I think, through the functionality, but I said I was going to talk about what's new, so let's do just that. Well, since the presentation last year, we've had both a 1.4 series of releases plus the new 2.0.0, which starts our new 2.0 line. Some of the things I'm going to cover were in the 1.4 release, so if you've seen them before, that's okay. They weren't all released just last week. Containers and collections are the first thing I wanted to talk about. So we introduced a new package in 1.4, which is called container, and this provides utility methods around some of the container elements that were already there, and also some new functionality. So it wraps the simple containers that we saw before, holding elements such as the border, layout, center grid, hbox and more. These have much more convenient constructors than they used to. And the image that appeared illustrates how you can combine these to create more complex displays as well without having to write any layout code yourself. We've also gathered and we're starting to add to the collection of structural containers such as the app tabs, which is helping to split up the areas of your application a split container, which you can see there with horizontal and vertical alignment, and scroller as well. And more are going to be added down the road. Now, perhaps the largest uh, area that widgets have expanded in a while is the collection widgets. This is an area of the toolkit that is better adapted to managing really large data. For anybody who's written a fine application before, you'll probably be familiar that there's a lot of code involved in arranging the widgets that you want, and then applying the data that you have into the widgets. That's a lot of manual code, but also if you're displaying lots of data, you're creating a lot of widgets. So the list, table and tree were introduced to help manage that. The tree that you see uh, there is one of these, and they are all designed to represent, to screen very complex or large data sets without needing to load them all at the same time. To do this, we have new caching APIs internally that are going to take care of a lot of the heavy lifting and make it as light as possible. We're using templates. Instead of constructing every single widget before it's shown, we are asking the user to create uh, a single element that can be then adapted when the data is loaded which means that we can do lazy loading properly. The table, which you see um, on the right-hand side there, adding another element, but, and it may only be showing probably nine elements in there, but we have managed to verify that performance is still good with hundreds of thousands of elements backing in the data source. This was a big step forward for using more complex data sources and presenting them to users, but we wanted to go one step further and so in this recent 2.0 release, we added data binding as well. This means that you're able to uh, disconnect the widget from the data source 
and have the program um, be automatically configured to synchronize the widget state with the source of the data. So this comprises a few different parts. We have first primitive types, and these are approximately equivalent to the types that we'd all be familiar with in the Go language. We have the data binding representation for bool, int, float, rune, and string. It was decided not to do float 32 and 64 and all five different versions, if I call, for int types, because at this point we're dealing with a slightly more abstract concept of data. Um, however, each of these that could be represented by different sizes is using the largest, so we don't get any um, loss of data that could occur. Each of these can be created new in memory with a zero value or they can be bound to an external primitive, a variable that you've already created. And the data binding will keep the everything in sync. But if you change an external piece of data and need to inform the data binding, then calling reload on the binding will make sure that everything is, is kept up to date and the appropriate listeners are going to be fired. We also have the more complex um, representations for list, map, and struct. The list its um, type is, is typed, and so you can have string list or float list. That makes sense because lists are often containing exactly the same data type. Map, however, is untyped because, as you would know, uh, mapping to various different types is quite common. So we have a string key and the untyped or interface type as the value. And struct is basically a special kind of map where we are binding to an external data source that is represented by a struct and using reflection to map it into a sensible data binding system internally. So the list and the map can be bound to new in-memory objects like new primitives, but the struct of course needs the external data source and the same Reload would be required if you externally change that data and the data bindings will discover what's changed and do a minimal uh, or as small as possible uh, event propagation to the widgets that need to update. And then we have the ability to bind to preferences so you can automatically persist the data present in your application. So how do we use it? Well, here is an illustration of a new data binding with a zero value string, and that's going to be presented as the data source for an entry. Every time the user changes the value of that entry, the string binding is going to change. Anything else connected to that binding will update, and a preference source, if you have wired it in, will be written as well. We also support conversion. So you could have a float data source like we see here, and then before presenting to a label, you convert it to a string. You could do this automatically with the default format, or you can specify the format like here. So the, the label will display value zero or uh, whatever the updated value of that float will be. And this is all two way data binding. So changing any element along the chain is going to reapply the format and present it to the user. Additionally, we have added a new repository package to complement the storage that we've added in 1.4. And the URI still is the unique representation for an element that is going to be used for a data source, like a file path, but capable of much more. We use file internally, obviously, for, for file access, but also content as is going to be used on Android and some other systems. And we can add more built-in types like HTTPS for, for accessing web resources down the road. Um, usage of this new system is much like you would have been accessing files using URIs in the previous release. You call reader to get a reader for the URI, or you could call list in the storage package to list the child elements that might exist under such a URI. And the great thing about this design is that applications can also add their own repositories. So by registering a new repository, with the scheme, the element at the beginning of the URI. You can plug your data source into the entirety of the Find ecosystem. And so you could, for example, load an SFTP source and start browsing it with the file open dialog. And uh, just one last thing then on what we added in this latest release. Animation 
and custom themes are two great improvements to the toolkit. Animations allow movement changes to various properties on an object, and the API is designed to make this as easy as possible, and also to sync it with the graphical frame rate in the driver that's loaded. And so we can see here, a move and resize and color change all in sync. And then at the bottom, we're illustrating the different types of animation curves that are possible and can be specified by any animation that you want to add. And then we've also added more functionality around themes. They are now easier to use to configure elements of your application. We added the ability to change icons and we've enhanced the properties that you can change regarding colors, fonts and sizes. So the two applications we see here are just examples of fine applications that really look completely different, but have the advantage of all of the, the benefits in the, the toolkit, the cross-platform approach as well. So the this Beeb emulator or, or Game Boy are going to work on any device that a fine application will. And you can see it doesn't look like the fine application examples that I have shown you earlier. Well, goodness, I hope that was um, helpful. I feel like we've covered um, some interesting stuff there. Thank you so much for listening. It's been really great to present this to you. I, I hope that you find the project interesting. And if you would like to learn more, there's plenty of places you can go. We have our main website at find.io or the developer documentation at developer.find.io. We also have our YouTube channel shown there. And I occasionally uh, will also do live streams on the Twitch uh, platform as well, if you want to check that out. We're always grateful to uh, sponsors and anybody who would like to back the project in some way. You can do that through the GitHub Sponsors platform. You can sponsor the project or any one of the individuals in the project. And also, if you would like to encourage me to do more live streaming or want to be involved in the content I'm going to be making, I have a Patreon channel there as well. And if you prefer reading we, uh, a physical book or ebooks, uh, just this week um, we have published this packed title, Building Cross Platform GUI Applications with Fine. This is up to date with all of the 2.0 APIs and shows five worked examples of different applications that you can build, as well as an introduction to why the project exists, what we hope to achieve, and wraps up with distribution, best practices, and, and so forth. So everything in this talk and more. Uh, I hope that you are able to pick up a copy if you're interested. And if none of those really appeal, we would just love to hang out with folk who are interested in the subject. You can join the fine channel on the Gopher Slack server. Thank you so much, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the event. Have a great day.